Hello everybody, my name is Brandon. Welcome back to the channel. I'm here today with the very first episode in what I hope to be a long-running series on this channel, and this is entitled Cinefessions Conquers the Criterion Collection. So as you guys know, if you've been watching the channel this year, I have a relatively large collection of movies from the Criterion Collection. I enjoy the company very much. I love supporting them. I love having the releases in my collection. But that said, there is a shockingly large percentage of films from the Criterion Collection that I own that have gone until this point unwatched. And so the goal of this segment or this series is simply to watch films that I own from my Criterion Collection and then talk about them. So frankly, even though I have been toying with this idea for months now, I still don't really know the exact way I want to go with it. Today, I'm going to talk about the seven films I watched back in July from the Criterion Collection. But initially, I had planned for this to be just a single film uh, video. I would talk about one release and talk about all of the special features on that release and then talk about if I think if the, you know, if it's worth it to own it or not. But that's not really where this one is going to go. I will talk about some of the supplements, but it's mostly going to focus on the films. So let me know. I really want your guys' input on this going forward. Would you like this to continue to be just a kind of, I, and I can't even guarantee how often this is going to be up, monthly, bi-monthly, kind of random whenever I watch X amount of Criterion Collection films? Do you want me to film a video and then talk about it in this kind of capsule review form that I enjoy doing so much? Or would you rather me talk about each film individually as I continue through this series? Uh, I'm down for anything, really. So let me know down in the comments below how you would like me to handle Cinefessions Conquers the Criterion Collection, and I will do my best to kind of uh, make that work for both you and for myself. So we'll see what you guys come up with. Let me know down in the comments below. So if you are someone who has not spent a lot of time with movies from the Criterion Collection or their releases, let me kind of talk about just a little bit what makes Criterion Collection special, at least in my eyes. It could be different for everybody, but for me, what makes Criterion Collection so special is their ability to put context around a film. Watching a film without its historical context is an experience, and frankly, it's probably the one that you and I have most often with a film, and that experience can be plenty. It can be a positive experience, a negative experience, or it can lie somewhere in between. But what the Criterion Collection offers really is just a different type of experience through their special features or their supplements, as they're called on the disc, uh, which can be audio commentary tracks. They can be the essays in the booklets that are included. They can be full length documentaries at some, on some releases. Whatever the case may be, the goal is always to provide more context to the film that you've just watched. This can be real world context, helping place the film in its accurate time in film history, or it can be a more personal context with backstories on the director or the actors, for example. Whatever the case is, whatever context the Criterion Collection is providing, it always adds to the experience of that film. And that is exactly why I love supporting the Criterion Collection so much and why I love having their releases on my shelves. Not only are they gorgeous to look at, the special features are incredible and the uh, transfers, generally speaking, are some of the best out there. So that is why I am dedicating a segment to specifically to the Criterion Collection moving forward. So hopefully you guys are as excited about this as I am. So as I mentioned, we have seven films to talk about today and I've spent enough time jabbering. So without further ado, let's dive right into episode one of Cinefessions Conquers the Criterion Collection. I also want to mention that all seven of these films are actually ones that I picked up last month in the Barnes & Noble Criterion sale. So if you have watched my Criterion Collection tour, uh, you will see what releases I had prior to, you know, this sale. But I did pick up a bunch, obviously, last month, which you can check those out in my uh, couple pickup videos that I posted last month. But starting off, we have a film that I actually first started watching on Amazon Prime, but the transfer for it was just terrible. It was frankly unwatchable. So 
You know, I was uh, kind of intrigued with what I was seeing, but I just, I wasn't really fully engaged because the transfer was so bad. It was so hard to really see what was going on on screen. So I stopped it and said, you know what? I'm just going to pick it up during the sale and hopefully I'll enjoy it. So that film is from 1945. We have Edgar G. Almer's Detour. So this is a film that has gained a lot of notoriety lately. One, because it came out through the Criterion Collection. And two, it is a film that Quentin Tarantino often cites as one of his favorites, which obviously we know Tarantino has a ton of favorites, but that's okay. We all do, don't we? Um, so Detour is a film noir and it is, oh, it is so much fun. So Detour is the story of our main character here, which frankly, I'm forgetting his name. I watched it over a month ago at this point, but uh, he is down in his luck. He is, uh, <laughs> his girlfriend has decided to move to Hollywood. I believe he's in uh, New York to begin with. His girlfriend has decided to basically dump him and move to Hollywood in order to try to chase her dream as an actress. And eventually he decides, you know what, I'm going to try to follow her. So he's trying to hitchhike his way across the country to go find his girlfriend. On the way, though, he runs into nothing but bad luck. And watching him deal with that and just the things that happen to him along the way is so fascinating. This is one. This is really nice and short. It's 69 minutes long. So it is only an hour and nine minutes in length. But man, it is, they, they pack a ton of interesting things in here in that short 69 minutes. This film is fantastic. If you have not spent a lot of time with film noir, which frankly, I always have liked everything I've seen that, you know, one would consider a film noir, but I have not spent a ton of time with it. I've only probably seen a handful of films not from, you know, that style. It's not a genre. I understand that. It's more of a, a filmmaking style that was kind of necessary back then just because they were doing things on the cheap. So this one is one of the best I've seen. And it's so low key. Like I'd never heard of it until the Criterion Collection released it. So that's another reason I love Criterion is because I find out about films that I never would have heard of otherwise. So Detour is one of those. And I am so glad I watched this. I have thought about this film ever since I watched it. And like I said, it's been about six weeks now since I've watched this, closer to seven. And I always think about this movie. It just stuck with me. And I loved it so much. It's just so, so much fun. So... I really like this one. Talking about the special features, I did watch the, it has a lot on here, but the one I watched was Edgar G. Almer, The Man Off Screen, which is a 2004 documentary about his life. And you can see all of the supplements there. And it was a really well done uh, special feature. It talks more, less about this film in particular and more about him as a director who I, again, had never even heard of him as a director, but he's done a ton of work. And uh, this one is looked at as one of his most underrated films that he directed. Uh, so I think that documentary alone was worth it. It was excellent. There are some other things on here as well. Um, there's an interview with uh, a film scholar who actually wrote the book on Edgar G. Almer. So taking a look at the cover art here, it is excellent. I love the cover. I think it looks so good. Uh, very taxi cab like, which I really like and is obviously very purposeful. Um, the booklet here has the essay written by Robert Polito called Some Detours to Detour. I have not read this one yet. It's a pretty long one. Uh, usually they'll have like multiple essays. This is just one really long one. So not check that one out, but if you're interested, it's in there. So this was such a fun film. I am so glad I ended up picking it up last month. So I am giving Detour from 1945, four out of five stars. I have a video planned to release here in the near future where I talk about my favorite subgenres of horror. And one of those that I'm going to talk about is the home invasion film. And that's exactly what this one is. So I had to pick it up from the Criterion Collection. We have 1997's Funny Games. And this is directed by Michael Haneke. So this is the original. So this is in German. Uh, he actually did release a, a remake of this, which is a shot for shot remake for the most part in 2007 with uh, Tim Roth and Naomi Watts. And that's how I saw this film for the first time was the American uh, remake. And I loved the American remake. It had some weird things that I wasn't sure I was understanding, but this has those also. And I think I got it a little bit more the second time. But again, it was really through watching the special features that I understood a little bit better on what Haneke was going for here. So this film is just a mean nasty little flick. It is, it does not pull any punches and it is, 
<laughs> quite memorable because of that. So if you are into home invasion films, check this out. If you've seen the original, check it out. Now, I will say, I don't think that this one is notably better or notably worse than the Americanized remake that came out a decade later. It's just a little bit different. The acting here is absolutely incredible. So if you guys have followed, even, you know, before the channel, even on the podcast, you'll know that one of my favorite things, one of my favorite techniques in film is the long take. And there is a 10 minute scene after just some of the most horrific stuff you can possibly imagine goes on. There's a 10 minute long take with just these two actors living in that moment and trying to deal with the situation at hand. And oh, it is stunning. Watching the special features, you find out that he only filmed that twice because the actors just, you, you can only ask so much from your actors and they couldn't possibly do that more than twice. And fortunately, they delivered on their, their second take, which is the one they use in the film. And it was stunning. It is 10 minutes of not complete silence, but um, the majority of it is silent and it is just, it pulls you in and it does not let you go until it gets to the next scene. This one is, ah, it is just, <laughs> like I said earlier, mean. Now, special features wise, I watched the uh, interview with um, Haneke and Arno Frisch, the actor, and uh, it was very interesting listening to Haneke talk about this film. Um the experience that he had at Sundance when this was originally when this originally premiered was kind of one of those once in a lifetime things that really cemented, I feel like at least, what he, you know, kind of his work as a filmmaker. And he talks about that at great length. And I thought that was really cool to 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 you know learn about. And then he talked about the 2007, you know, remake and how basically everyone just brushed it off because it was a shot for shot remake. He I think he even says in there like no one asked why I did this. They just simply, you know, wrote it off because it was a shot for shot remake. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, so as someone who has seen the remake first and then came to this, I don't know that I like one better than the other. I think, you know, Tim Roth and Naomi Watts are incredible actors as well. This one might get the nod for acting though, but um, I don't know. I just, I, I really enjoyed this and I think it is just so unique in the home invasion film uh, genre, subgenre, because it does a lot of different things. It is not your typical horror film, not your typical thriller. It is very aware of what it is and what it's doing. If you've not seen this, I definitely recommend checking Funny Games out. So I'm giving Funny Games from 1997 four out of five stars. This next one was actually a new release from last month, and it was one that I was super excited to add to the collection, but it was incredibly difficult to find last month thanks to that half-off sale. I got lucky. I, as soon as I seen it come in stock, I didn't even bother calling because every time I called a, a Barnes & Noble when it said it was in stock, they said, oh, I'm sorry, it's on hold for somebody. So I didn't even bother calling. I just did an in-store pickup order online, and I was able to get it through curbside. Um, but we have, from 1953... War of the Worlds, and this is directed by Byron Haskins. So first off, let's just talk about the cover here. This is some of the like some of my favorite art on a Criterion Collection cover. I think it looks so great. The spine with this like lime green and, and yellow is just beautiful to look at. Uh, the back looks, you know, just the same. It looks great. And then you have just an awesome disc. And you can kind of see the the opening page or the front page of the booklet here, which does have an essay. I didn't talk about the booklet in Funny Games, but that one does have an essay as well. Um, so this one is Sky on Fire, and it's written by Jay Hoberman, another one with just one long essay as opposed to multiple. But take a look at that uh, kind of wraparound art there. It looks amazing. So just a really cool package on this one and one that packaging alone I'm happy to have in the collection so okay so the film itself so I'm a humongous fan of the Twilight Zone I remember my sister and I would just uh, watch it from you know it when it, the marathon started because on sci-fi they used to play like the 24-hour marathons every New Year's Eve through New Year's Day and we would look forward to that every year when it from you know the year it started on and we would just spend hours and hours and hours watching Twilight Zone um, I love it and I love old, you know, 1950 sci-fi films. I really enjoyed the H.G. Wells book as well, which I ended up reading. It was either last year or late 2018. I don't remember exactly, but um, 
I love the Tom Cruise film, the 2005 Tom Cruise one. I love that movie so much. I just got that on 4K last uh, last month for my birthday. Such an awesome film. That said, this one is one that I, I totally respect it for what it is. And then after watching, again, the special feature, which I only watched one of the special features on here, and there are quite a few, so I will be coming back to this disc, but it was the one about the special effects. And it was such a really cool special feature because it just gives you more uh, appreciation for what they're able to do with the effects in this film. But So I, I'm kind of uh, dancing around it a little bit, but I didn't love this one. I liked it. Uh, what I think is kind of my issue with it is that when I watch like a, a 1950s sci-fi film, generally speaking, it's more of a, it feels more of like a low budget, more intimate affair. This is definitely a large budgeted Hollywood movie. And I feel like it just kind of loses a little bit of its appeal because of that. Now, you know, that's nothing to say, uh, you know, about the acting. I think the acting is fine. I think the, the characters are interesting to watch. Um, you know, you get a lot of that, those 1950s sci-fi tropes in there with the characters, but that's fine. That's what you expect when you put on something like this. Um, I, it really feels like the first half feels significantly different than the second half. The second half feels more of like that War of the World style that you're expecting, but it feels really small scale. So the first half is incredibly small. You are following, you know, a few characters, a handful of characters after what they believe is like an asteroid or something landing in the desert uh, near California. From there, I expected it to get a little bit bigger than it did because it's War of the Worlds. But this one really felt like War of California or War of Los Angeles. Like it felt very small scale as opposed to even, you know, some, some of the smaller budget films that I see uh, that have alien invasion as a theme. So because of that, I didn't love this. I totally respect it. It's one that I am absolutely happy to have in my collection. And I will recommend to you, if you do typically like Twilight Zone uh, series, you like alien invasion films from the 1950s. Uh, if you typically like those types of things, you'll probably get a kick out of this. You'll enjoy it like I did. It's just unfortunately not one that I see myself visiting over and over and over again, unlike some other films that I've seen from this era that I just loved to death. So this is good, not great. Still happy to have it in my collection. So I'm giving The War of the Worlds from 1953 three and a half out of five stars. Next up is a film that I think I put on like 10 years ago, watched maybe the first five or 10 minutes before falling asleep, and then just never went back to it. So it's one that, you know, has been out for a little while now on Blu-ray specifically, but I just didn't have much of an interest in it until for some reason last month I decided, you know what, I need to own this movie on Blu-ray. And uh, boy, am I glad that I had that desire. We have 1962's Carnival of Souls, and this is directed by Herc Harvey. So this is, wow, what a film. This is kind of, it has a feel of like Night of the Living Dead, but not because it's a zombie film. So don't get me wrong there. It just feels like a filmmaker who is going above and beyond what he really uh, should be capable of. He's very clearly a talented filmmaker, just like George A. Romero was. So it's probably a terrible <laughs> comparison, but that's just the idea, the feeling I got when I was watching this film. So Carnival of Souls opens up with these uh, two sets of teenagers, a car with boys and a car with girls, and they're drag racing. And eventually they get to this bridge and the boys accidentally chase the, the girls off the bridge. So they go into the, to the river below. Unfortunately, two of them perish and one of them walks out. So after this event, she decides to uh, move away. She's going to take this job as an organist at a church because that's what she does. She's an organist. Um, but she starts seeing these visions and she starts seeing these, uh, specifically this man coming after her. And so we are following her as she's trying to figure out what's going on. The title, Carnival of Souls, is uh, as she's driving to this uh, this new city that she's going to work in, she sees this old abandoned carnival. And obviously that is going to play a, a factor in the film at some way, somehow. This is another one that I was just hooked from the start. And it didn't let go until the credits were rolling. Uh, this is another short one. It's only like 78 minutes long, but it is a very, uh, it, it feels very quick, but the story itself doesn't move at a fast pace, if that makes sense. Uh, it, it never felt like it was moving slow, 
But there are these more slower, intimate scenes that really help drive this character's uh, state of mind to the viewer. And I think it's just so well done. Uh, the individual that she sees in these visions is genuinely frightening. It is creepy as hell, I thought. And it is done so, so well. The Some of the cinematography on this just felt so far ahead of its time that I'm shocked that this film doesn't get talked about more than it does. I know it is a well-respected film, but man, some of the things this does here, this is one of the better horror films I've seen from the 1960s. It is awesome. I was really blown away by this, but this is one that unfortunately I have not dove into any of the special features yet, but I definitely will be coming back to it just because it is a film that demands to be seen more than once, which I'll probably say at least a couple more times as we're going through this video, but I loved Carnival of Souls. If you are a horror fan at all, and if you have not seen this film, you owe it to yourself to check this one out. It is definitely worth the, cri the price of admission. Uh, the, the transfer looks incredible, much better than that five or 10 minutes I was watching of that like public domain DVD that I owned way back when. Um, the, the visuals in this are just stunning at points. It is such a fantastic film. I loved it. Looking at the release itself, so you have a really great uh, hand-drawn cover there with the main character. That is the back. And then you get a, another um, essay here. This one is Thinking Like That, Don't It Give You Nightmares, written by Kirla Jan Janice. So another long essay from them. And then it has this incredible poster on the back, which is going to be just destroyed because of the lighting, but you get an idea. It has our, our main, uh, antagonist or, or the main antagonist. Yeah, that's right. Uh, has our main antagonist on it and it is so cool. I would love to hang this one up, but I'm sure I won't just because I want to keep my criterion collection movies complete, but still a beautiful poster. So this film was so, so good and it kind of blew me away. I was not expecting to enjoy this one nearly as much as I did. If you've not seen it, check it out. This release is definitely worth it. So I'm giving 1962's Carnival of Souls four out of five stars. If you guys checked out my book wrap up last month, you'll know that one of the graphic novels I read in July was Ghost World. And the reason I read that was because I ended up watching the film Ghost World from 2001. And this is directed by Terry Zwigoff. So this was one that was completely not on my radar, radar whatsoever. My buddy, I asked him, hey, if you can pick one film for me to buy during this sale this month, what film would it be that I don't already own? And his answer was Ghost World. So he knows me really well, obviously. We've been friends for a very long time and we always talk film and media in general. So, you know, very close. So he knows my tastes and he knows my style. And boy, Chris, you knocked it out of the park with Ghost World. This is... I, probably the best film I've seen all year. It is one of my favorite films that I own from the Criterion Collection now. It is everything I didn't know I wanted. So Ghost World follows these two girls who are played by Thora Birch and Scarlett Johansson, much younger, obviously a 2001 Thora Birch and Scarlett Johansson. Um, but they are just graduating high school as the film opens up. And it's essentially a story about what do we do next? What comes after high school? It is very much so a coming of age story, but done in such a unique and funny and frankly, beautiful way. Uh, it hit me completely out of nowhere and I was left stunned. I was in tears at points in this film just by the sheer beauty of it all. Oh, this movie just rocked my world and I cannot stress that enough. The acting here, you also have Steve Buscemi and the way Buscemi and Birch play off each other is so much fun. Buscemi is just an incredible actor to begin with, but I, this, man, it's hard to say it's my favorite role because he's incredible in Fargo and just virtually everything he does, but this was one of the more unique roles I've seen from him and I thought he did a stunning job with it. Um... Scarlett Johansson, obviously a fantastic actress, as is Thora Birch, which I'll talk about in a second. But uh, ScarJo is so awesome in this uh, young role she's playing here. Uh, you know, I think both the girls are 18, 17, 18, somewhere in there. And just the... <laughs> The dry humor, it just, it reminded me so much of high school. Like I graduated in 2004. These girls are graduating in 2001 and it just felt so familiar to me. 
And it's just a film that was really made for someone, you know, my age. Thora Birch does such a phenomenal job here as well. Her character has probably the biggest uh, emotional arc throughout the film. And it is super understated, but it is there. And every scene, there is something going on in this character's mind that's helping drive the plot forward. And it comes through with the way she performs. It is marvelous. This film is one that everybody should seek out. Really, I can't think of a reason that you wouldn't want to watch this film to at least try it. Obviously, I can't guarantee you're going to love it. It might not be for you, but it was absolutely for me. I'm so glad. Thank you, Chris, for recommending this one because it was absolutely one that I never would have watched had he not recommended it. So thank God for friends and thank God for awesome recommendations. So this is another one I have not dove into the special features yet, but I absolutely will because I want to watch it again. Like as soon as it ended, I literally wanted it to go. I wanted to go back to the beginning and hit play again. The release itself. So we have really nice cover art here and then that purple and pink background on the inside. You have this really cool. They're like snapshots of what looked like, you know, kind of when they were filming, they took snapshots of it. And uh, they plastered them on the inside here, which looks really cool. There's the disc. If you're interested, talking about the booklet now, we have a really thick booklet here, which is filled with a lot more art, which is awesome. Um, and a few essays. So we have uh, Seance and Wowsville by Howard Hampton and then About the Music. So that's actually by Terry Zwigoff himself. So this is a Daniel Close um, graphic novel originally. So I would imagine that a lot of the artwork in here is from Close. I can't promise that. That's just a, an assumption, I guess. And we also have a little uh, graphic novel, the little comic. And uh, this actually has some pages from the original graphic novel, which I was just realizing. Um, and then it has a where are they now section in the back, if I can get to it. So very cool release. Love it. So, so happy I ended up watching this film last month because, oh, it hit me in all the right places. So this is just a beautiful release and an absolutely beautiful film. I am so glad now 19 years later, I am finally on the Ghost World bandwagon. It's amazing. I am giving Ghost World from 2001 five out of five stars. Next up is another film that actually the same buddy recommended to me, though he didn't know he recommended it to me. It was a, it's a favorite film of his and has been for years. He's always talked about it. And it's one I've wanted to see. I actually picked it up on a whim and I'm going to say the title correctly now because that was probably the most comments I got on, a, on, my, on that video was how I said it wrong. This is E2 Mama Tambien. It's not Y, even though it is a Y, it's pronounced E. So E2 Mama Tambien. And this was released in also 2001. So two films from 01 back to back. And this one was amazing as well. So this is another coming of age story. This time though, we are following these two boys as they go on a trip. Uh, their girlfriends actually are uh, going away on a vacation at the start of the film. And so they are alone for the summer. And they happen to run into this woman who is married to one of these guys' cousins. Um, and they she sets off on a road trip with them, which I'm not going to talk about why, because I could, would consider that a spoiler. So uh, they it, it's a road movie. The first probably, I don't know, 30 minutes of it or so are not. They are you know in the town that they live in and kind of setting it up. But then the rest of the film is definitely a road movie. And that's really where that, uh, you know, that coming of age story takes place. So this was another one that was just so beautiful. Um, this is directed by um, Alfonso Cuaron, who is one of my favorites. He did Gravity. He did Children of Men, which I think is one of the most underrated films out there. Um, he did Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which is amazing. I know he did Roma, which I have not seen yet. It's on my Netflix to watch list, which I, that just reminds me I need to actually get to that. But he's an incredible filmmaker, and this is no exception. This is just such a profoundly meaningful film, which sounds so you know, hoity-toity, but it is just really a story about life, a story about friendship, about what it is to grow up, uh, about sex. There is tons of sex in here if you're looking for that. Uh, it is beautiful. The, the the setting here, they are driving through the Mexican countryside in order to find this beach, and it's just lively. It feels so genuine, which I'm sure it is. Like, they had to be using locals while they were filming this because it was just so 
realistic and well done. I don't know. This was such a a moving film from start to end. And frankly, maybe not from the start. From the start, it's just like, wow, there's a lot of sex happening right now. But then as they get on this road trip and kind of more of their characters, more of the backstory is played out, it becomes very moving. Um, it's another one that I was in tears by the end of it. It was fascinating to watch. I loved this one. It's another one that I'm so glad I picked up. Unfortunately, I've not spent any time with the special features, which there are quite a number of them here. Um, the Actually, this is a two disc, so it has like the two DVDs, not that you can see them, two DVDs and the Blu-ray. Um, so you can see full there. Um, this booklet is quite large. So this one has a whole bunch of things in it, which is always fun. You can see the table of contents there. We have Dirty Happy Things by Charles Taylor, and then E2 Mama Tambien biographies, and then something about the transfer itself, which is in all of these booklets. But uh, the setting here, the, the the filming locations, the story itself, it's it's awesome. Like this is just another one that I'm so happy I ended up picking up on a whim last month. So again, thank you, Chris. Because without him talking about it in the past, I never would have checked out this one. So I am giving 2001's E2 Mama Tambien four out of five stars. The last film I watched from the Criterion Collection last month is another one that was a completely random pickup for me. I've always heard good things about it, but have never seen it. And that is from 1989, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, directed by Steven Soderbergh. His debut feature, by the way, which makes everything on here just that much more special. Of course, this was one of those indie darling films that probably everybody else on the planet has seen except me. But it was, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, really what helped change filmmaking. It was made on such a low budget and yet made so much money. So, you know, it's one of those films that really genuinely helped shape the history of film. And so it's a very important film, if nothing else. But fortunately, not only being important, it is wonderful. This is, and I know I've said it a ton, but this is just another beautiful film. It is almost impossibly intimate. Like, I didn't feel like I was watching actors on a screen. I felt like I was watching a genuine marriage crumble in front of my eyes. And it was devastating and wonderful and uh, just uncomfortable at points. Like, it was amazing. It is everything that kind of moves me when it comes to filmmaking. And it just reminds me why I love film so much. Something else like the, like Ghost World just reminds me of why filmmaking is so powerful, why it's so profound, and why it can be so special. This is another example of that. So we have our four main characters here. We have Anne, who is pictured here, that's played by Andy McDowell. Her husband, John, played by Peter Gallagher, who I knew from The O.C., if you ever watched uh, The O.C. back in the mid-2000s. And then uh, Anne's sister, who is um, played by... Uh, Laura San Giacomo, who I knew from Just Shoot Me. And then we have Graham. And so Graham is basically John's old fraternity brother from college. And he's kind of down in his luck. And so he's going to move in with them for a little bit or stay with them for a little while until he can get back on his feet. Uh, so John is a lawyer. I think he just made like junior partner at his firm. And so he's gone from the house quite a bit. Anne is very clearly not very happy with the marriage at this point, but she's doing her best to make do. Um, she suspects, though, that John is cheating on her, which, of course, I don't think it's a spoiler that happens within the first like five minutes of the film. He is cheating on her and it's with her sister of all people. So right from the beginning, you just have this despicable taste in your mouth for two of these characters. Uh, and I think that works really well as the film plays on. So I think Anne has the most interesting character arc through this because she goes from you know, just from point A to point B, I'm not going to talk about it because I feel like it's giving spoilers or too many spoilers. So I'll just say she has a wonderful character arc and her acting throughout is so wonderful. I mean, really all four of these people are fantastic. James Spader is, wow, he is so good in this. I don't think I've ever seen James Spader better than I have seen him in Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Um, so he actually ended up winning the the best actor in at Cannes when, when this debuted. Um, and that really kind of set his career on a different path than he may have been on in the beginning. And so it's just fascinating to see what this did for so many people. Um, the fact, again, that this is a debut feature just blows my mind. Um, this really shows you what you can do on very little. Like after watching this, I'm like, you know what? 
I want to go out and make a movie now. Like, I just, I think it's so powerful in that I love watching a film and having that feeling afterwards because that means that they did something right. It moved me in a way that I want to be able to move somebody else, you know, in that same, in that same way. And so that is kind of the highest compliment I can give this. Um, it is, like I said, just impossibly intimate at points. It is, oh, it's so well done. The moments here are so small, but they are so personal between these characters that really helps make them feel real and just cements them as memorable characters. I absolutely love this one. This is another one. I didn't watch a ton of special features, but I did watch the one about the, um, the audio or the audio of the film. So that was a problem I was having while watching this. My, I have to watch my movies near my, uh, for my air conditioning unit. And unfortunately it just kept kicking on and I was having a hard time hearing it. So I just had to turn it up very loud. But so I was wondering like, is that just this film? Cause I don't have that issue all the time. And it turns out like the audio on this film was something that they struggled with quite a bit. Now, mind you, I'm not complaining about the audio on this release. I think Criterion does a fantastic job with it. It's my setup. That was the issue more so than the audio here, but it might've been a little bit quieter than I'm used to. But the documentary on this was really fascinating. It has the uh, sound editor slash re-recording mixer, Larry Blake, and then the compo composer, Cliff Martinez, who both of them, basically this was kind of their, their start in film and they've continued to do this all the way until now, uh, working with Soderbergh quite a bit through all of his films and his TV work. So it was basically like these two old friends reminiscing about good old Steve and the good things that he's done for them throughout his, his life, including all the way back to this film. Uh, it's just really fun to watch. They have such great chemistry because they've clearly been friends for a very long time and they have some really fun stories to listen to. So that alone makes this worth owning. I, I just the film, buy, own this film, watch this film any way you can. This was very, very moving. I absolutely loved it. So I am giving Sex, Lies, and Videotape from 1989 four and a half out of five stars. All right, so that is all of the films I watched from the Criterion Collection last month, and it was just a remarkable month for watching movies, and that's mostly thanks to the Criterion Collection. Um, Ghost World has jumped up to be one of my favorite films of all time. Sex, Lies, and Videotape is right up there. E2 Mama Tambien is up there. I mean, like, these are just genuinely great films for the most part, so highly recommend all of these if you are looking for some recommendations for the next Criterion Collection sale, which will be in November. So hope you guys enjoyed this. Please let me know what you want to see on episode two of Cinefessions Conquers the Criterion Collection. Do you like these more uh, kind of capsule reviews that I've been doing? Or do you want me to take a deep dive into a single release? And if you do, let me know which movie you'd like to hear me talk about because I have a good number of them. So uh, chances are I might have it if you list it down below. If you do want to see my entire collection, check out my Criterion Collection tour. I have a part one and a part two. And then check out my two Barnes & Noble hauls that I posted last month thanks to the sale. That way you'll be able to capture everything I have in the collection. So let me know down in the comments below. Have you guys seen any of these films? What am I right on? What am I wrong on? Let me know down in the comments below. I would love to have more of a conversation with you guys down there about the Criterion Collection and about these films down in the comments below. So let me know down there. As always, if you guys enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Cinefessions here on YouTube. And if not, thank you anyway for watching this video. I really do appreciate that. All right, guys. So that's going to do it for today. I just want to say thank you guys so much for watching and I'll catch you next time.